Hey y'all, Scott here. I've decided to start playing game systems with names that perfectly describe me, so... I'm gonna start playing the Microvision. What's shaped like a brick and gives you hours of fun? It's a close second. The Nintendo Game Boy. That's right, it's a minor. Easily one of the most important systems in gaming history, and for good reason. There's some truth to why old people call anything that beeps a Game Boy. They worry me. But every time you see a portable video game device in a cartoon or something, it's almost always modeled after the original Game Boy. Two buttons, a D-pad, cartridge slot. This thing is so portable game system. And even though I never officially owned one before my virgin phase, it doesn't feel like it. The original Game Boy launched a line of systems that lasted over 20 years, most models being compatible with the games from that first one. I remember bringing my Game Boy Advance to kindergarten, to which most 80 year olds would say, that makes me feel old. The other kids and I would swap games around and try my out on our own systems, and I saw some of them having these weird gray cartridges. I was only used to the Game Boy Color in advance once. Then one of the kids whipped out their Game Boy. It was the original, and even back then I thought, oh, we gotta see what happens when we put a newer game in there. This is amazing! No matter what era of Game Boy you grew up with, you still sort of feel that attachment towards the others. It's all Game Boy at the end of the day. Ever since, I've always had a huge interest in that first era of Game Boy. I loved my Game Boy Color and Advance games, but I wanted to see what it was like one generation earlier. And now that I waste my time, I can finally use the original Game Boy and see what it's like. It f***ing stinks. The Game Boy was created in response to the booming success of Nintendo's home console, the Nintendo Entertainment System, and the limitations of their LCD games, the Game & Watch series. The NES gave you long lasting experiences each on their own cartridges, some of which were high score based games straight out of the arcade, but many were taking gaming to the next level. Rich stories, new worlds you want to explore, definitive endings, just like a divorce. The Game & Watch games were a line of handhelds that contained one game on each, using an LCD display like a calculator. These pretty much had to be arcade style games, just see how long you can last, try to win, like a divorce. Now, handheld game systems with cartridges weren't anything new, but they weren't anything good. Mostly dumb, simple, high score based games. A few of them were kind of fun, but most of these, they mainly just gave your thumbs a job. So what if we took how rich and deep the games on NES can be and shrunk them down to fit in a mouse? That was what Gunpei Yokoi was born to do. The designer of numerous Nintendo toys, the Game & Watch, and Cataracts went in and created a portable game system using interchangeable cartridges and a dot matrix screen. That sounds more impressive than it is. It's a manually operated fiber divider. The project was codenamed after the screen, Dot Matrix Game, or DMG, and didn't have a final name until Shigesato Itoi suggested the name Game. Game Boy. This thing was developed with durability, longevity, and budgetary constraints in mind, launching at only $89.99 on July 31st, 1989 here in North America, April 21st, 1989 in Japan, and September 28th, 1990 in Europe. Nintendo has almost always been about fun on a budget, and nowhere was that more obvious than with the Game Boy. Look at this box, the future is here, f***er, and it's called 1989. This looks incredible, and then you play it! Really funny stand-up routine, dog shit system. Even when Nintendo was being more realistic with their images, like on the back of the box here, this screen still looks leagues better than what we actually get. A dot matrix display, what does that mean? It means let's get the hell out of here! Well, I guess if the Game & Watch has a display like a basic calculator, the Game Boy has a display like a more advanced calculator, one that can display more than just variations of the letter O. I mean, it still displays any old spray you could ask for here. It definitely can be used to play video games from this era. It just so happens to be ass green. Thank God I'm colorblind. The screen here is the Game Boy's biggest flaw. Not only is it not lit in any way, shape, or form, but it's not just black and white, it's black and puke. They used a green display with no colors because it helped the non-color visuals pop out the best at a low cost. Or they just thought it'd be funny. This is easily one of the most notorious elements of the original model. You can't use it. We have a contrast dial which helps us see in numerous different lighting conditions, but for playing it dark, have an open mouth. We got the volume slider, headphone jack, and speakers for stereo sound, an extension port for accessories on an off switch, a port for an AC adapter, a battery compartment begging for four double A's, eight A's for just one device, and a full suite of buttons, the exact same buttons you'll find on an NES controller. They were obviously cutting corners a lot, but Nintendo ensured you would get as close to a console experience as possible with this thing. Of course, other companies responded, and they responded big. Just bring the damn TV with you at this point. Competition towards the Game Boy quickly emerged. Systems by Atari and Sega had full color displays that were in fact lit up. These systems were more powerful and I think people bought them out of fear of being crushed. All signs pointed to these things wiping the floor with the Game Boy, 
but Nintendo had a few aces up their sleeve. The initial price point was significantly cheaper due to the Game Boy's cost efficiency. Not using a color display will do that to you. They're all about saving money. I'm sure Nintendo employees eat cereal with water. Due to using cheaper technology, the Game Boy was not only more portable than the competition, its battery life was actually tolerable. I can't remember the last time I put batteries in this thing. It's just been run off the same ones for years. It can withstand 15 hours of continuous play on four double A's. Sega's Game Gear and Atari's Lynx contributed to the battery life movement we're dealing with today. I think the Game Boy's design was far more appealing to everybody. These things honestly both look the exact same. The Game Boy was unique and it feels great to play. It may be bulky by today's standards, but you can still fit it in a pocket. All the buttons, the D-pad, they feel fantastic, like actual console controller buttons. Handhelds usually have the audacity to include small clicky buttons to fit on a slimmer, tinier device compared to home console controllers. The Game Boy has these big meaty buttons that just feel right. They feel substantial and none of Nintendo's future portables really replicated this feeling. It's a little awkward, obviously not the best it could possibly be, but it's well designed for 1989 and at its price point, it accomplishes what it set out to do and while that definitely added to the reason the Game Boy absolutely drain the Lynx's blood for fun, the core reason it did so well was the games. It's in the f***ing name. The Game Boy launched with five games here in North America, with one being notoriously bundled in. Not Yakuman. Tetris was already a well-known PC game at the time, but the idea to bundle it in with the Game Boy, genius. Nintendo was considering to put the game Super Mario Land in with the package, but was told while that would help the Game Boy appeal to kids, packing in Tetris would help the Game Boy appeal to everybody. So in North America, the Game Boy launched with a Tetris game cartridge, not only helping the system, but the Tetris brand as a whole. These two things go hand in hand. Neither one of them would be the great success they became if not for each other. Tetris on the Game Boy continues to be one of the best versions of Tetris. I know what you may be saying. Scott, fucking Tetris is fucking Tetris. No oh, man, grass was way better back then. Hear me out. It's crazy, but not every version of Tetris gets things right. The controls feel off. The core Tetris gameplay is altered ever so slightly, but if you want the most pure and perfect version of Tetris, it's on the Game Boy. The iconic theme is here, it all controls well, it works perfectly within the Game Boy's limitations, like everything appears on screen just fine. It doesn't mess around with modes that are kinda cute, then you never play again. It knows what you want, you jump in, play Tetris, jump out. It's basic, but not to a fault. And that's what I like about this version. It's simple, but it's perfectly simple. This helped the Game Boy tremendously, but that doesn't mean there weren't other games aiding to its success. Right alongside the system's launch came Super Mario Land. I always found this cover it to be so modern looking for a Mario game released in 1989. Prior to this, Mario artwork was still in its peach fuzz era. This one feels right in line with official art for the series released today. Of course, Super Mario Brothers helped to catapult the NES into superstardom, really being a game everybody had to try for themselves. Truly a revolution, so it's fair to expect Super Mario Land to be the same. This game creeps me out. I love Super Mario Land, and I think most good people do. But I think it's mostly because of how charming the game is with how primitive and simple it can be. It's a very basic and short Mario game, though it has a few elements unique to it. You don't get fireballs, you get super balls that bounce around, turtles explode on impact, a few side-scrolling shooting stages, and we have our first title with a question mark in the middle. The physics are messed up here. If you're running, it doesn't really carry into your jump that well. You fall like a rock. Precise jumps are hard to make, but none of this really matters. Like I said, the game is just so damn charming. It's not difficult, it's super short. You can beat it in like 30 minutes, so it's like, why complain about it? Is being critical about Super Mario Land going to change the world? Why does it matter that it doesn't control perfectly? It met the requirements of being Super Mario Brothers on a portable system, and that was a big deal. It still feels like Mario, and you could take it wherever you wanted. I'm sure the screen of the Game Boy gets really blurry when there's a lot of movement. It can be hard to see enemies coming at you when you're running, but it's still playable. It's charming as all hell, and I still love going back to it over and over again. The game is simple, yet still Mario. The problems with the game are more so fun little quirks rather than deal breakers due to how short and easy the game is. I adore this game. Critically, you could tear it apart, but I feel like most people can see right past the flaws and enjoy this game for what it was back in 1989. The other launch titles were more so just the bare minimum of what Nintendo thought a game console needed at the time. Baseball and Tennis, pretty much the same as the Baseball and Tennis games for the NES. Stay away. And there was Alleyway, just a basic breakout clone, still fun and charming though, which is the opinion I have for most of these old Game Boy games. Yes, looking at them with a modern lens, they're all bitch simple. But being portable games in the late 80s, I find them to be more interesting than many home console counterparts they had. Like, I would so much rather play baseball or tennis on Game Boy than NES, and that may be because Nintendo's re-released their NES games far more often than their Game Boy ones, but I find these more endearing. The NES is more capable than this. The Game Boy? I'll take what I can get. Overall, not a bad launch lineup. Two of the most iconic games on the entire platform, one of them packed in, a fun breakout game, and two sports titles if you want to get laid. The original Game Boy model wasn't the hottest looker, though. 
this thing looks like it would just taste awful. So eventually, six years later, Nintendo released a line of Game Boys under the slogan, Play It Loud, The Deaf Revolted. These were the exact same systems from 89, but now there were so many different color options. This is during Nintendo's rambunctious phase, trying to be cool for all the 90s kids. Yeah, stick it to the man, buy a yellow Game Boy. These are pretty nice additions to the lineup, but this was six years after the launch. The Game Boy lasted so long, and for a giant chunk of its lifespan, it was still just that old brick. The next year, in 1996, Nintendo finally released a revision titled the Game Boy Pocket. And the most tolerable handheld goes to this. It is a fraction of the size, comes in a variety of colors, only costs $69.99. The screen is bigger, clearer, doesn't get as blurry during motion sequences. Doesn't look fucking disgusting, only uses two AAA batteries instead of four AA's. This is a huge improvement, though I do still think the original has more character. Just look at the fonts for the buns. This looks like a PowerPoint presentation. Plus, I don't think it's as comfortable as the 89 model. I don't like it when my hands on the back touch. Keep these things away from each other. But the pocket helped rejuvenate the Game Boy, giving it a much needed modern makeover. It was still incredibly affordable and at this point had a treasure trove of games in its catalog. Plus most of the problems with the original were made much better now. But one thing still needed fixed. Two years later in 1998, only in Japan, Nintendo released the final revision, the Game Boy Light. One of the biggest issues with the Game Boy line was the lack of any light on the screen. You just straight up couldn't see it without some kind of light source. The Game Boy Light, however, popped a backlight into the display, which you can turn on and off. Without the light, this thing lasts 20 hours on two double A's, which is amazing. And then with the light on, it lasts for 12 hours, which is still very respectable. The handheld is very similar to the Game Boy Pocket in terms of design, but a bit larger, which makes it more comfortable. The backlight is pretty much just here so you can play in the dark. It doesn't make the screen more viewable in good lighting conditions. In fact, half the time I can't even tell it's on. It makes the handheld playable at night. That's pretty much all it does. You know, I was hoping it was gonna give me advice. The problem is this revision released a mere months before Nintendo released the full upgrade. The Game Boy Color. Featuring a color screen and exclusive games, it was pointless to buy this, even if it had the backlight and the color didn't. Since these are released so close to each other, it's understandable why this never left Japan. Also, America hates vision. It didn't make sense to make consumers decide between a light and a color when it was obvious the color was what Nintendo really wanted to sell here. The original Game Boy wasn't discontinued until 2003, living an incredible 14 years, and it really lived on for far longer than that. The Game Boy Color and Advance were compatible with these old games, with the Advance being discontinued in 2010. The Game Boy line was so popular, with the original first three models selling 64 million plus units before the Color's release in 98. And all of that can be attributed to the great games release for this thing. Like Mach and Chase and Mortal Kombat 2. I have a soft spot for the Game Boy library, but even the best games are often gimped in some ways, though every Game Boy game I've played, I can always appreciate them, far more than a lot of other games from this era. It is so charming to go back to when this was portable gaming. It's fun to see where concessions were made and they aren't too egregious considering you're, you're playing it on this, okay? What were you expecting? <laughs> These cartridges are adorable. They're like NES cartridges you can choke on more easily. And the NES is the best console to compare to the Game Boy as most of these titles feel like black and white NES games. The Game Boy definitely isn't as capable as the NES in many ways, so games sometimes don't run as smoothly as they do on there. But again, taking the era in which this was released into consideration consideration, you're getting a fairly comparable experience on the go. The problem is, the Super Nintendo was right around the corner and was the primary system during the Game Boy's life. So while the Game Boy can do NES style games quite well, bringing Super Nintendo like games over cracks me up. We can see that with the sequel to Super Mario Land, released three years later, Super Mario Land 2, six golden coins. You collect coins all the time, who cares? Mario Land 1 was a solid portable take on the Mario formula, though it was kind of in the camp of good enough. That game on any hardware other than the Game Boy would be executed. Mario Land 2, well that's actually just a flat out great game, regardless of it being on the Game Boy or not. Definitely feels more like Super Mario World on the Super Nintendo, for better or for worse. The game does struggle with how big and chunky the sprites are. I mean, the original Mario Land, I was worried the sprites were my spittle on the screen. Here, everything is big and bold and I love it, but we can a lot more slow down because of that. Mario Land 2 does struggle a bit with being a full-size Mario game on the handheld, but that doesn't stop it from being one of the best Game Boy games. I'm not sure I'd consider it to be one of my favorite Mario games. I kind of feel like it's made cooler just because it's a Game Boy game, but it's a great title in its own right and deserves more recognition. It was the debut of Wario. I can't say that about myself, but they ended up taking him from this game and making him the whole focus of the third Mario Land, Wario Land Super Mario Land 3. Can't wait for Max Payne's Super Mario Land 4. I 
always forget there were three Mario Lands, but it's completely fair considering the third game is an inbred take on a third game. Super Mario Land 3 isn't a Mario Land game, much like how Super Mario World 2 isn't a Mario World game. They both take characters from the previous entries and give them their own spin-off series. They just had to give them a Mario subtitle to really sell it to ya. Sure. Wario Land is its own game. Starring Wario, it launched an entire series of mostly handheld platformers, including Wario Land 2 on the original Game Boy as well. What makes Wario Land work is how it really throws you a curveball. You head into it expecting a Mario game, but you get off-key music and mechanics that make these games truly their own thing. There aren't a ton of Mario spin-offs on here. NES games like Yoshi, Yoshi's Cookie, and Dr. Mario got Game Boy versions. Dr. Mario is a weird one considering it's all about matching colors. Who did they f to make this work. There was one Mario spin-off that was the Game Boy Zone though, something fresh, something new, something definitively Mario. Mario's Picross, because the Ted Danson deal fell through. Picross is a puzzle game, kind of like mixing crossword puzzles with Sudoku. Each row and column has a number and that denotes how many squares are shaded in. So you compare each and figure out where exactly to chip away and we have art. This game has almost nothing to do with Mario outside of the menus and a few puzzles, but it doesn't stop me from loving this game to bits. It's such a fun and addictive puzzle game and most critics say that too. It sold like ass. Well, at least we have Donkey Kong. That's the full name. Most people call it Donkey Kong 94 based on the year it was released. In a sentence, it's great. In a longer sentence, it's really great. I mean, this is a Game Boy game, a continuation of the arcade title. We all asked, what happens next? Another whole ass game! A puzzle platformer made specifically for the Game Boy. This isn't like Mario Land 2, where that's an amazing game that does sort of struggle with the limitations of the handheld. This was made with everything in mind. It is, in my opinion, the perfect Game Boy game. And they followed it up with a nightmare. The Donkey Kong Land series. Three games, all meant to be supplemental titles to the three Donkey Kong countries on Super Nintendo. You have to admit, these are impressive on the system, and they are their own games. They take heavily from their home console counterparts, but these are unique level designs. It's just, my god, these don't work on this thing. The sprites are so detailed, which is impressive, but it makes the game nearly unintelligible. That's a problem with many Game Boy titles. They didn't take the screen's quality into consideration. I will say, it's not as bad as you think it'd be, but you just can't make out what's on here sometimes. Man, these are just the novelty to go back to today. Even back then, they were like, wow, it's Donkey Kong Country on the go. Now it's like, wow, they sold this. Donkey Kong 94 is definitely the one to go for. These are neat from a historical point of view, but just play the Super Nintendo games like Jesus. That was the biggest issue with Game Boy games, when they tried to be far more than what they could be. Like, stop it, man, you're gonna hurt yourself. If the Game Boy released a few years earlier, we wouldn't have had this issue as much, but because it was thriving during the reign of the Super Nintendo, Nintendo wanted to put Super Nintendo quality games on here, so we got games that tried to stand toe-in-toe -toe with what was on consoles at the time. Case in point, The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. This is a full-blown Legend of Zelda game. It's pretty much the same length as Link to the Past on Super Nintendo. Nothing's compromised. If anything, Link's Awakening takes the core of Link to the Past and makes it work on a Game Boy. It's pretty crazy. Playing on an actual Game Boy model, though, this is rough. I have no idea how anybody did this. I mean, at least with the pocket, maybe. But I can't imagine playing this compared to the re-release they did for the Game Boy Color. Like, my god. The game also feels very shoehorned onto the platform. You have to switch between different items all the time in this game. Like, constantly. Which forces you to go into the menu, swap out items, go back, swap them out again. It feels like if they made this game from the ground up for the Game Boy, they'd take the lack of buttons into consideration and not design a game around using all these items and having to swap between them over and over again. With that being said, Link's Awakening is a lovely game. It has so much charm being the first mainline portable Zelda adventure. They did some weird things with this one, including tons of cameos from other Nintendo properties. This is obviously a stone cold classic. The only problem is the system it was made for. When it got a full remake in 2019, it showed how much of this game at its core was already perfect. They only really changed things that were there due to the limitations of the Game Boy console, like the whole item swapping debacle. Other than that, it's the exact same game and that speaks volumes of the original Link's Awakening's quality. This wasn't a completely watered down portable throwaway game. This was the real deal. And Nintendo's had that mentality with all of their handheld systems, which is why I think they've always succeeded. Whenever Sega or Sony would put out games on their portables, they were always lesser versions. Who cares about that Uncharted? It's just a side story. When Nintendo when Nintendo made a Zelda game for the Game Boy, it was the next big Zelda game. When Nintendo made a Metroid game for the Game Boy, it was a mistake. What am I doing? Metroid 2 Return of Samus, a fair attempt at a Metroid game on the platform. To be honest, Metroid during this time period was a bit too cryptic and obtuse for my Donkey Kong 94 brain. These games are so difficult to do 
anything in without a map. You have to draw one out yourself. In 1991, sure. In 1994, go f yourself. Well, Kid Icarus got a sequel on the Game Boy 2. Kid Icarus of Myths and Monsters, strangely a game that never released in Japan and was the only other Kid Icarus game until 2012 with Kid Icarus Uprising. This is basically more of the same from the NES game, but again, that's impressive and exactly what customers wanted. If you were buying Kid Icarus on the Game Boy, it was because you wanted Kid Icarus on the go, not a card game spin-off, Sony. That doesn't mean other companies didn't put their beat teams on the Game Boy versions. We got a whole heap of third-party home console conversions, like five Mega Man games. Some Castlevanias, Contras, a bunch of Final Fantasies that weren't actually Final Fantasy, they were random RPGs Square brought over to North America and called them Final Fantasy. These were all up in the air, like sometimes they can be good, and sometimes they're Castlevania the Adventure. I really have a love for the first Game Boy Mega Man game, Mega Man and Dr. Wily's Revenge. The Mega Man Game Boy games are like remixed abridged versions of the NES ones, but sometimes they weren't just remixed abridged versions, they were bad. Even then, I still look fondly upon all these games, even if they weren't that great, they give you fairly authentic portable takes on these franchises. Franchises. Like Mega Man looks and plays like Mega Man. Same with Castlevania, Double Dragon. The only exception I'll make is this fighting game Street Fighter 2 Mortal Kombat Killer Instinct. I feel really bad for the kids that said, Mom that. Like, man, Mario's right over there! The fighting games felt more like things for your thumbs to do rather than actual engrossing video games to play. I mean, this gave you a Street Fighter 2 like experience on the go but I just feel like you had way better options. Like, as handhelds progress, you can make an argument playing Super Street Fighter 4 on the 3DS helped you practice for playing the console version. No, there's not much to these versions. They're the fighting games on the Game Boy. A worthy attempt, but they just aren't what the Game Boy's good at. Like, puzzle games were the Game Boy's jam. Not only did we have Tetris, but Tetris 2. This isn't Tetris. Tetris Blast! Who the f are you? Tetris Attack. I love you, but stop lying. Kicks is great here. One of my favorite arcade games. A Taito classic published by Nintendo on the Game Boy. The Game Boy can handle this. Right? No matter how poor the hardware is, you're always gonna have somebody out there who wants to be a smartass. X was a Japan-only game published by Nintendo that laid the groundwork for Star Fox. 3D! In black and white! It's the future yesterday! Baseball 2000, a first-person shooter? Yeah, I mean, it's the Game Boy, it can do anything. I think Game & Watch Gallery helps show what the Game Boy was best at. These are remakes and ports of classic Game & Watch games, and it's a treat to have this era of Nintendo represented on the Game Boy, as it was its direct predecessor. Balloon Kid, a sequel to Balloon Fight? Perfect fit for this thing. Thing. Great for simple, addictive gameplay. Space Invaders? Yeah, sure, it's great. The Game Boy may have had a lot of well-known franchises continue on it, but it started a few key ones. Mole Mania debuted on the Game Boy. That's something you hear every day. We get it. This is an obscure Nintendo-developed game. It's produced by Shigeru Miyamoto, and it's a fun puzzle game. You go between the top layer and bottom layer of each stage to get to the end. It feels like something that should have seen more success, but Nintendo realized kids hate moles. You! Wave Race started on the Game Boy. Yeah, Wave Race 64. That's a sequel to a Game Boy game just called Wave Race. I never hear anybody talk about this, and honestly, for the longest time, I just thought Wave Race 64 was the first Wave Race. They just put 64 on the title because it's Nintendo. They're crazy. They made a game about moles, okay? But shockingly more important was the conception of a white guy. Kirby's Dream Land debuted on this thing, ushering in the Kirby series as a whole. The box art illustrator didn't know he was supposed to be pink. Welcome to hell. The original Kirby's Dream Land was designed around being a beginner's game. It's stupid easy and short, but that's what it was always meant to be. Kirby's supposed to be a shut your brain off kind of game, and Dreamland is a fun one to blast through sometimes. This was followed up with an NES sequel, Kirby's Adventure, but back on the Game Boy, we got Dreamland 2, which was definitely a huge upgrade, but even back then, Nintendo milked the hell out of Kirby. Pinball Land, Block Ball, Star Stacker, Kirby got so many spin-offs on the Game Boy, it's ridiculous. It's probably because Kirby was the perfect choice for the face of that original brick. All of his games were simple, easy to pick up, and worked on the system well. Putting him in a pinball game, a breakout clone, a puzzle game, it all made sense. Kirby fits everywhere. Put him in court, I don't care. Well, those are the most iconic titles on the Game Boy. Of course, there were hundreds of garbage whatever games, but even the worst games, Honestly, I still have a weird appreciation for them on this thing. Bad games are way more tolerable on the Game Boy, and I feel like it's because I look at everything here and appreciate it all due to the limitations. Rummaging through a crate full of old gray Game Boy cartridges, there's something magical about it. No matter how good or bad the game is, I just find original Game Boy games to have this undeniable charm about them. Being in black and white and on a system you have to hold up to a light to be able to play, it's weirdly endearing. 
and just the fact Nintendo supported the system with so many accessories shows other people agree. I mean, come on, the Game Boy Camera? That's so stupid, I love it. At one point, this held the world record for smallest digital camera. Doesn't mean it's good, you can't hold me accountable for saying that. You can hook this up to the Game Boy printer to print off your pictures. It works across a few other games and uses receipt paper. That way, it doesn't require ink cartridges, just a specific roll of paper, which is such a Nintendo decision to make. The Super Game Boy allows you to play these games on a Super Nintendo on a TV, which made for the ability to actually enjoy some of these titles. We got screen lights and magnifiers, which just made things worse. Battery packs, the link cable, connecting your Game Boy to another one for multiplayer action. God damn it. Pokemon is the biggest media franchise of all time. Starting on the original Game Boy, it helped keep the handheld alive for so long, releasing late in its life. It's an RPG series about collecting and battling monsters called Pokemon, and it spawned countless sequels, spin-offs, movies, music, merchandise. It's hard to think where Nintendo would be in the portable market today without Pokemon. Okay, I said it.